Anyway, uh, as most of you know, I'm assuming that uh, the lecture today will be by Jerome Greenfield, who is a long-standing scholar and a man who, whose work I've respected for years in terms of his uh, even-handedness and serious scholarship on not only uh, in response to Ergonomy and Reich's work, but also in terms of his overview of the social and political implications of uh, the uh, persecution. I don't think that any other word could actually be used <coughs> of uh, Wilhelm Reich. And he's continued uh, the, his, his initial book, uh, Wilhelm Reich versus the USA, which is still a standard uh, reference work for anyone interested in this material, uh, is not, it's not available. Well, you can get it on the internet yeah. for about two, two or three hundred dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but you can also try occasionally. It used to be, you always used to be able to go to Strand Bookshop and find, but now not as many. But uh, occasionally you'll find used copies. Um, but it's, if anyone is interested in it, it's, it's, it's not only an excellent source of information historically, it also has a very, very good, simple, and pretty honest you know, presentation of Reich's basic premises and basic work, which I think is very valuable. I often recommend it to students who want just a general overview of what Reich did uh, and, 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 and said. And so, but he's continued over the years to follow up and access materials that at various times have become available. And so today he's agreed to come in and talk on his ongoing work and his background, you know, the background material on the three, some people were surprised, on the three essential prosecutions and attempts at bringing right down, you know, starting as early, oh, there probably were more, but in this country there were only three. Uh, but uh, starting with his arrival here and the problems with the uh, you know, uh, immigration authority and then with the FBI investigation on the possibility that he was a German operative uh, or maybe a, a Russian operative. It wasn't, they weren't ever exactly clear. Uh, but, but they thought he might be an operative or something, especially since he spoke German. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, and then the final, uh, uh, you know, uh, major uh, campaign with the Food and Drug Administration. So, um, uh, Mr. Greenfield will Present. We're going to take a short break, which is not we usually go straight through, just uh, for uh, a few minutes, and then uh, we'll continue. Okay? There's coffee and bagels. Uh, anyone who wants to be on the mailing list during the break, you can give me your name. There's some literature here if anyone wants it, and I'll make some announcements before we leave. Uh, the title of my presentation is "The Emotional Plague in the Government's Three Investigations of Reich." <laughs> Excuse me. I'm not going to simply review the uh, contents of my book on the FDA's investigation uh, and uh, Reich's consequent uh, trouble with the American government. Actually, as I said, this is only one of three investigations, and it is these three investigations uh, together that I want to discuss here today. My purpose in doing this uh, is not only to acquaint you with the extent of Reich's struggles with the government, <coughs> but also to explore the degree to which the emotional plague was present and active in these investigations. I imagine most of you know the uh, term emotional plague. I'll have more to say about it later. But first, I have to comment on the word investigation. It's not quite accurate as a description of the process Reich was subjected to by these three agencies of the federal government. The dictionary defines investigation, quote, detailed examination or search to uncover facts and determine truth. But the word, as it is used by most government agencies, means something quite different. It means an effort to find incriminating information against someone. In other words, in the so-called investigations Reich was subjected to, the purpose was to find evidence of guilt of wrongdoing of some kind, rather than to ascertain the truth. Unfortunately, there's no word in the English language for this specific kind of process, and so I have to make do with the inadequate term investigation. Uh, most of you, I suppose, know something 
about the lengthy investigation, Rock and his work were subjected to by the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, over a 10-year period, which ended in his being imprisoned in 1957. The other two investigations, one by the FBI and the other by the INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service, are less well known. In fact, Reich himself was not clearly aware of them during much of the time that they were going on. He had occasional suspicions of things going on, but rarely specific facts. And when occasional evidence of some kind of uh, inquiry came his way, he did not know the full context of it, and so, understandably, sometimes misinterpreted it. For those who, because of this, insist on seeing paranoid tendencies in Reich, we can now say that if such tendencies did indeed appear in his behavior, there was a realistic basis for them. For, as the American poet Delmore Schwartz, is that name familiar to anybody here? Delmore Schwartz wrote, even paranoids have enemies. <laughs> One of the cleverest things I've ever come across. Thus, the assumption of such a tendency in right is not justified. Because anyone, let alone a sensitive and aware nature such as Reich's, would have gotten a hint of suspicious happenings faced by the government, uh, faced by the circumstance Reich was in. Let us, for example, uh, remember some of the rep more reprehensible aspects of these so-called investigations. One was that during the INS investigation, uh, no, no, excuse me, that's the FDA investigation, Reich's phone was bugged for some two weeks from a neighbor's garage when Reich uh, lived in Queens, about which I'll have more to say later. Uh, during the FDA investigation, his mail was opened at the post office in Rangeley, Maine, where he lived at the time, and read by FDA agents before it was resealed and sent to him. Which, I guess, most of you <coughs> excuse me, realized is something completely <coughs> illegal. Besides this, it is important to understand that Reich was under one kind of investigation, one kind of governmental investigation or another, during 14 of the 18 years that he lived in the States, with two of these investigations going on concurrently. A person subjected to this kind of scrutiny and harassment uh, going on, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, can hardly be seen as having paranoid tendencies if he exhibits suspicions of his environment from time to time even if he cannot always substantiate his suspicions. So much by way of introduction. I'll try to determine out to what extent the emotional plague was present in these so-called investigations of Reich. In order to do this, I will summarize the course of each of the three investigations and look at specific junctures and people in each of them from the point of view of what Reich has taught us about the emotional plane, how it manifests itself, and how it functions. But first, I'd like to review with you a simple definition of this term, emotional plane, as it is given in character analysis. It is as follows. The neurotic character, the neurotic character if in destructive action on the social scene. Wrote. And later, he defined the term more precisely and more pointedly as, and I quote again, human behavior that on the basis of a biopathic character structure operates in an organized or typical way in interpersonal, that is social, relations and in social institutions. End of quote. So keeping these definitions in mind, I begin with the earliest of the three investigations, that of the FBI. It started on December 7th, 1939. That's a very uh, strange coincidence, isn't it? December 7th, two years later, was the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And it also began three and a half months after Reich's arrival in the States. So this date, December 7th, 1939, was on a letter sent by an American 
consul in Norway to the American Assistant Secretary of State, some person by the name of G.S. Messerschmitt. And it read as follows. <laughs> I, I, I think I know why you're laughing. Messerschmitt. Huh? Messerschmitt. Messerschmitt, the name of a German airplane, yes. Is that why you were laughing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he wrote, I have the honor to apprise the Department of Information, which has come to me through confidential sources believed reliable, and please keep in mind this term believed reliable, concerning the communistic activities of Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who is understood to have proceeded to the United States a few months ago from Oslo, Norway. Reich is stated to have been a paid communist agent in Austria prior to Anschluss and to have been expelled from that and from other countries. It is said that he had a considerable political following now get this, including many women doctors. <laughs> many what? Many women doctors. Anyone who has studied the nature of Reich's involvement with the communist movement knows that he was never any kind of agent, paid or otherwise. So we can see how reliable these confidential sources are. <clears throat> but besides this, there is clearly malicious intent behind the remark about the women, many women doctors among his followers. The implication being of some kind of illicit sexual going on, going on. Though we don't know who the informant was, it is quite clear <coughs> from this last detail that it was someone interested in making trouble for Reich. Probably someone who knew him perhaps even someone who had worked with him in the pro and in the process become host became hostile as to him as happened in several cases. However that may be, I believe it is quite clear that his, or for that matter her activity as an informant falls within the elementary definition of the emotional play. Uh, his, uh, his misinformation would even be considered a, a specific plague reaction, as Mike referred to it, which is, and I quote, a preference for the use of sexual, that is moralistic, defamation, end of quote. Uh, one has to differentiate clearly between moral and moralistic. And uh, I think sometimes people don't make that difference, and it seems to be that, even though I don't know German very well, that uh, when Theodore Wolf was translating Reich into English, he used the word moral several times where it should have been moralistic. Now, there's a difference between them. A moral person is simply a person who behaves in an ethical way. A moralistic person is a person with a set of moral standards, and he expects everybody else to behave that way. That's the main difference. And it seemed to be that in several of the Wolf translations, when Reich was speaking against what, what, what Wolf translated as moral uh, behavior, moral uh, character structure, he meant moralistic. Uh, I'd ask you to keep this in mind as I continue. So to return to the FBI, shortly after the file on Reich was opened, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, turned the matter over to the New York office of the FBI, which in turn wrote him on March 7, 1940, that, and I quote, inquiry of, 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 inquiry of confidential, and the name is crossed out, discloses that Dr. Wilhelm Reich was on the so-called medical advisory board of the CPUSA, Communist Party of the United States of America which is the board which is understood to have to do with the publication of the magazine Health and Hygiene. This magazine was indeed a communist publication put out by the Daily Worker. Some of you may have recall or have heard of the Daily Worker, which was the official communist uh, organ in the United States. But the idea that Reich could have had anything to do with it at this time is, as I'm sure most of you know, preposterous. For as most, if not all of uh, 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 you know that by the time Reich reached the States, he had arrived at a firm anti-communist conviction in all his political thinking. 
So, do we have here another plague character bent on vindictive malice against Reich? Well, further inquiry by the FBI disclosed that there actually was a William Reich connected to the daily worker and that he had taught political economy at the communist worker school. So we can therefore assume that this was one of the, uh, the this was the one that the man on the advisory board of health and hygiene uh, got, had his name confused by the FBI. At this time, the case against Reich was summarized as follows. Just a minute, I think I skipped a Yes, the confusion between his name and that of William Reich uh, is therefore understandable. So it might well be that there was no deliberate malicious effort in this instance. The next step in this so-called investigation by the FBI was a communique from an American consul in Norway in response to inquiries about Reich previously made by the FBI. This communique states, and I quote, the consulate general has now learned from a highly reliable source, and of course by now we've learned how to take this term, reliable source, uh, learned uh, uh, by highly, uh, from a highly reliable source uh, that on his arrival in Norway, Reich became a member of the Norwegian Communist Party in 1936. However, he was expelled for not adhering closely enough to the party line, end of quote. The truth, however, is, again, I think some of you know, uh, quite different. Reich was never an official member of the Norwegian Communist Party. In fact, after the appearance of his book, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, and his writings on work democracy at this time, the Norwegian Communist Party, along with communist parties in other countries in Europe, denounced him. So here, we cannot say for sure if the so-called highly reliable source referred to in the communique from the American consul was honestly mistaken or was deliberately misrepresenting things in an emotional play kind of way. In the meantime, Hoover ordered the FBI offices to continue to gather information on, and I quote, the nature of Reich's activities and communist connections in this country, end of quote. And by May 1941, apparently enough of this so-called information uh, had been gathered so that Reich could be considered a potentially dangerous threat to the internal security, that's in quotation marks, potentially dangerous threat to the internal security, which is the way it's expressed in one of the relevant FBI documents. And a couple of months later, July 1941, a letter over Hoover's signature went to what was called the special unit of the government, recommending that Reich be considered for what was called custodial detention. That's a fancy bureaucratic term for arrest. Custodial detention in the event of a national emergency. And at this time, the case against him was summarized as follows. A medical advisor for CP, Communist Party, said to have been paid communist agent in Austria, expelled from Austria, he went to Norway, became a CP agent there, when expelled from Norway, came to USA, said to have a large following, especially among women doctors. <laughs> okay, so what we see from this, that there was really no further information, or more accurately, misinformation, um, gathered on right beyond what was known before Hoover's order. So then, on the basis of almost total misinformation, Reich's name was placed on the list of people who would be taken into custodial detention in the event of a national emergency. Now, is this a manifestation of the emotional plague? I think the answer would be that if it were, if there was no personal malicious intent in this decision, it would have to be considered simply as a manifestation of the stupidity and irrationality of bureaucratic functioning. 
which can facilitate the work of the play, but is not itself directly an expression of the play. Hoover himself, in relation to Reich at least, was not directly playing. But from what has been revealed about him since his death, he emerges as a classic play character. Some of you may recall, he hated the Kennedys. He hated Martin Luther King. He spent much time trying to find evidence of illicit sexualizing among them in order to ruin their reputations. Besides this, he devoted much of his time to discovering and exposing homosexuals in public office. And this, while, as it turned out after his death, he himself was a homosexual. And he himself, he was also a transvestite. Person, like to wear women's clothing. Uh, all this makes him a perfect embodiment of the worst aspects of the plague. For as Reich had written further, and I quote, sexual gossip and defamation afford the plague character a kind of perverse gratification. I said, I'm sorry, that's the play characters, a kind of uh, perverse gratification. They can thus attain sexual pleasure without the general, without the natural genital function. Interestingly enough, however, on the basis of the number of communications Reich sent to Hoover and the tone of these communications, Reich seems to have had great respect for the man. Uh, and that is because Reich knew him only as a militant anti-communist. While on the other hand, I think it's safe to say that if Hoover had had the slightest inkling of the sexual dimension of Reich's work, he would have acted very nastily and vindictively toward Reich and would not simply have ignored Reich's many communications about communism and communist infiltration. Into the government. In any case, Hoover's recommendation for custodial detention of Reich in the event of a national emergency was dated July 1941, still five months before the national emergency came about. That is the bombing of Pearl Harbor. <coughs> uh, during this time, the FBI, probably sensing the flimsiness of its case against Reich, tried to gather more substantial evidence by interviewing additional people who had had some kind of contact with Reich. One of them was Alvin Johnson, president of the New School for Social Research, where Reich taught for a semester or two in his first arrival in the United States. Besides Johnson, the FBI also interviewed Theodore Wolfe, Reich's co-worker and translator, as I imagine most of you know. And another man named Walter Briel, D-R-I-E-H-L, Reich's friend and psychoanalytic associate from Europe. And they also interviewed two letter carriers Rill and various neighbors. Who was a patient of Reich's. I'm sorry? Brill was also a patient Is that so? I did not know that. They had a falling out. I'm sorry? They had a falling out specifically over treatment. Excuse me, I won't make a note. Sorry. That's okay, thank you. Uh, Walter Brill. Okay. In any case, these uh, efforts, these interviews, yielded nothing. The New York office was finally forced to uh, report that there, and I quote, there was no evidence of subject communistic connection in the U.S. But this did not induce the FBI to remove Reich's name from the custodial detention list. And so, predictably, when Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, 1941, Reich, along with many others who were <coughs> under some kind of suspicion, were placed in custodial detention. That is, arrested. This arrest of suspected alien enemies, as they were called, began on December 9th, two days after the bombing. A book has recently come out called Communazis. Has anybody heard of it? In which 
the author reviews what happened after Pearl Harbor. Uh, the author does not mention Wright specifically, but he does go extensively into the idea that the FBI did not clearly differentiate between Nazis and communists. That's right. Yes, the uh, title of communist Nazis. The arrest after Pearl Harbor began two days later, December 9th. The Attorney General of the United <coughs> States stated that no alien will be apprehended on the score of nationality alone. Everyone taken into federal custody has been under observation for more than a year. End of quote. This is certainly not true. It's not true of Reich. Reich had not been under observation. And it's certainly not true of what happened to the Japanese. As some of you may know, I come from Seattle. A lot of Asian people, some of the people that I knew, were just summarily taken to detention camps during that time. <coughs> uh, but there was an aspect to Reich's arrest that makes it unique. Though he was under observation by the FBI <coughs> prior to Pearl Harbor, it was not as an enemy alien, or an alien enemy, excuse me, that is, as a possible Nazi sympathizer, but rather as a possible supporter of the Soviet Union. But we were not at war with the Soviet Union. And Reich was not a former national of Russia. Legally, he could be subjected to custodial detention only if, as a German national, or former German national, he was suspected of Nazi sympathies. But since Reich had been pursued by the Nazis, there was never any real suspicion of him being, having had Nazi sympathies. So what it boils down to was that Reich, there was that Pearl Harbor, the Pearl Harbor emergency, made it possible for the government to arrest, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, to, to arrest Reich on the grounds of being an alien enemy, that is a Nazi sympathizer and supporter, while the real reason was his suspected communist Russian sympathies. This led to much confusion and many inconsistencies in the proceedings against him which were reflected in the confused FBI records of this rigmarole, as we will see. In her biography of Reich, Ilse Ollendorf, who I imagine most of you know, Reich's uh, second wife, wrote that on the, the first night of his arrest, Reich, and I quote, spent, uh, slept on a spread out newspaper in a big hall on Ellis Island together with hundreds of Bund people. Of course, I assume most of you know who the Bund people are. Do you know? You don't know? Oh, the, the German-American Bund, a pro-Nazi group in the United States. Uh, it was people <coughs> like these arrested pro-Nazis that the emergency measures had been really meant to guard against in the event of Americans' entry into the war. Not someone like Reich, who had to flee from the Nazi Germany. You can imagine what it must have been like for him to be included in the ranks of these Nazi sympathizers, to sleep and eat among them, among people whose values and ideology he had been fighting against for almost a whole decade. The FBI files shows that an examination of the books in Reich's library by the agents who came to arrest him shortly after Pearl Harbor demonstrated Reich's anti-Nazi convictions very clearly. It appears, one of these agents wrote, that his work is primarily socialistic and that he makes statements which tend to show his hatred of Hitler and his dissatisfaction with communism. End of quote. And later, the same report has this. Reich states in his work that the first sensible thing to do would be to uproot Hitlerism and that the Soviet Union has not done anything towards advancing a solution to the problems of human society. <clears throat> Thus, one cannot help wondering how, in the light of these statements, the FBI could possibly have continued suspecting Reich of either Nazi or communistic activities and sympathies. Part of the answer 
I suspect, lies in the level of stupidity that characterizes the bureaucratic mind mentioned earlier, and about which I'll have more to say later. Another part of the answer probably lies in the fact that there must have been a great deal of confusion in the government attempt to implement its contingency plans and the panic and urgency immediately following the Pearl Harbor attack. And there was little time available for making distinctions and dealing individually with people in uh, the custodial uh, detention list. Reich, of course, knew nothing of all this and continued while being imprisoned, trying to convince the authorities that he was not a potential threat of any kind to the American government. He submitted dallies of the preface to the function of the orgasm, which was in the process of being published in English, to an FBI agent on Ellis Island with the handwritten note saying, quote, this preface contains a general survey of my work and my social views, which are based exclusively upon my function as a physician and research man, end of quote. In addition, Wolf had a two-hour interview. I assume most of you know who Wolf is, am I correct in that assumption? Uh, he was uh, Reich's co-worker and also uh, translated, Reich, was the first one to translate Reich from German into English. Reich uh, met him when Wolf was in Germany. Uh, Wolf was uh, instrumental in getting Reich out of Germany just before the war started. And he was also instrumental in getting Reich a job teaching at the new school. And uh, then he continued in uh, uh, relations with Reich, uh, translating his other books until Reich learned enough English to be able to write directly in English. Uh, in addition, this Wolf, Theodore P. Wolf, had a two-hour interview with the same FBI man, at which time he tried to explain Reich's anti-fascist and anti-communist ideas. All this, however, led nowhere. The bureaucratic machinery continued to grind on at its own pace, and finally, some two and a half weeks after he was arrested, that is on December 26th, Reich appeared before what was called an Alien Enemy Hearing Board, an office that had been set up to deal with any errors that may have been made in the large-scale arrests of people who might be dangerous to the country now that it was at war. The record of this hearing shows that the FBI agent mentioned earlier, the one who had gone through Reich's library and had come across the term sex economy, uh, the, US attorney of the, uh, the U.S. attorney at the hearing had gotten wind of the term and stupidly explained to the board that, and I quote, Dr. Reich is one of those individuals who relates all political problems to sex, end of quote. This man showed other evidence of contempt for Reich and his work and could well be considered a full-blown emotional plague type. For example, in his further evaluation, he wrote, quote, Reich appears to be egotistical. His personality definitely characterizes his race and country, meaning Germany and the German people, an indication that uh, racist thinking was not ex the exclusive uh, terrain of the Nazis. Reich apparently recognized this man for what he was, and several years later, later, wrote about him in This Little Man as follows. Now, some of you who've read that book may recall this. You said I was a German, or again, a Russian spy. You had me jailed, but it was worth it, little servant of the state. So miserable were you." End of quote. During this hearing, predictably, Reich uh, uh, Reich was asked, I'm sorry, about uh, possible communist connections and sympathies. The matter of Nazi sympathy was touched on only once briefly in a very indirect way. Nevertheless, in the above mentioned report, the U.S. attorney, amazingly, that the one that Reich wrote about as the little servant of the state, 
cited the charges against Reich as pro-Nazi, possesses Nazi literature. This refers to a copy of Mein Kampf in Reich's library and a book titled The Life of Hitler that the arresting FBI man found there as well. To believe that someone having books by or about Hitler indicates sympathy for Nazism and not the desire to learn about it is, I think, too stupid even for the FBI. Especially in view of Reich's earlier quoted statement about the need to uproot Hitlerism. I believe this pro-Nazi possesses Nazi literature statement was simply a lame attempt given Reich's birth in Germany to justify his arrest as an alien enemy. The hearing, however, finally concluded that Reich had not engaged in any pro-Nazi or even pro-communist activity, and therefore that he should be unconditionally released. But bureaucratic machinery functions, it does not function very efficiently, and he was not released till January 4th which means that he had been held in detention among Putin's Bundist Nazis some, for some four weeks. A short time after his arrest, Reich's status in the FBI file was changed. He ceased being considered dangerous, and during the next couple of years, his name was also removed from the list of suspicious people of, uh, in the other FBI offices. The FBI was even finally able to conclude that Wilhelm Reich and the known communist William Reich were not the same person. But this did not prevent the same issue from arising a few years later during the INS investigation, as we will see. But before turning to this next uh, chapter in the history of Reich's investigations by the agencies of the American government, I think it's important to point out that at the time of his custodial detention, none of Reich's books had as yet been issued in English, and his work, therefore, had not yet reached the level of notoriety and had not yet provoked the widespread irrational opposition that developed a few years later. Uh, when individual people and organizations encouraged the government in its two subsequent investigations, to uh, stop Reich. Perhaps the FBI would have been less willing to change Reich's status if it had had any suspicion of what Reich's work was about. Okay, we come now to the matter of Reich's uh, trouble with the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which lasted much longer than his trouble with the FBI. That is, it lasted some nine years though it did not involve his arrest. But the emotional plague influence was much more clearly in evidence than in the INS case investigation than in the FBI one. The way the INS began its efforts to have Reich deported in, to his country of origin was due to the efforts of one specific particular individual, a man named Albert H. Crombie, of Columbus, Ohio. He was solely responsible for setting this process into motion. Crombie was an apparently very energetic, enterprising, and moralistic, please remember the distinction between me being moral and moralistic, a moralistic man who shortly after the World War II started up an organization, or rather I guess I should call it a business, which he called Youth Problems Incorporated. Pretending to be a nonprofit educational organization, Youth Problems issued short booklets. Uh, these were meant, uh, 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 short booklets uh, written by Crombie himself on boy-girl conduct problems. These were meant to be issued in schools and churches. Uh, some of the titles of these booklets, so you'll get an idea, Crombie's approach to what he euphemistically called boy and boy-girl conduct problems. Some of the titles were The Plain Truth About Juvenile Delinquency and Decent Living and 
how our bodies grow. These booklets were primarily advice to adolescents to avoid all forms of sexuality, petting, masturbation, and of course, intercourse, so that they could grow up to become clean, stalwart, stalwart law-abiding American adults. Crombie was on the verge of a big business deal with educational organizations in the state of Ohio. The deal involved the purchase of 500,000 copies of his booklets at a cost of $35,000. Now that may not seem like very much now, but back then, I guess what would be equal to $35,000 would be what, half a million? No, half a million dollars today, maybe? Okay. I'm sorry? More? 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, this deal involved the purchase of 500,000 copies of his booklets at a cost of $35,000 for distribution throughout the schools of the state. In a letter he sent to these organizations, to give you a more concrete uh, idea of his approach to adolescent sexuality, he wrote, the words male, female, passion, desire, birth control, intercourse, period, intimacy, abortion, menstruation, masturbation, cohabit, and the names of personal organs of the human body do not appear in any of our booklets. <laughs> <laughs> Albert Crombie, he continues, Albert Crombie, no, Albert H. Crombie, does not believe that sex education can or should be carried on in high schools, and Youth Problems Incorporated does not publish or distribute sex education material. End of quote. In other words, Crombie combined his own aversion to the very idea of adolescent sexuality with a way to capitalize financially on what he hoped would be a corresponding widespread aversion to adolescent, adolescent sexuality. Thus, he emerges as an almost classic example of the emotional play character who, Wright wrote further, carries on, and I quote, life destructive activity and honestly believes in his ostensible goals and motives because he acts under a structural compulsion, end of quote. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but, and acts under a structural compulsion to change his environment so that his way of life and his way of seeing things are not jeopardized, end of quote. A person like this, Wright went on, quote, senses everything that is at variance with his way of life as a provocation, end of quote. And as regards sex, such an emotional plague individual, and I quote again, cannot be anything but pornographically lascivious and sadistically moralistic at the same time. And you notice it's moralistic, not moral. Although I could find nothing about Crombie, Crombie's personal life, I think it is safe to assume from what is known about human psychology in general that anyone who is so vehemently opposed to the very idea of adolescent sexuality as Crombie was, a person who made such opposition into a crusade, a way of life, and a business is acting under some powerful compulsion which most likely covers impulses in the, uh, boy, hold on, in the opposite direction. That is, that very lasciviousness that Roy excited. Crombie's fanatical opposition to adolescent sexuality, in other words, can be seen as a reaction to his own powerful, yet repressed, and therefore distorted sexuality. In any case, Crombie's $35,000 deal was never carried out indirectly because of Reich. It happened by sheer coincidence that the head of the Child Guidance Center in Des Moines, Des Moines, Iowa, was acquainted with Reich's work, and he sent some of Crombie's booklets to Reich, and received a prompt reply as follows. Reich wrote, the distribution of such pamphlet is not, pam pamphlets is not motivated by any desire to help youth in its most burning problems, but by reasons which have nothing whatsoever to do with the problems of adolescence. The motives can be found in some sectarian or political ideology or in commercial or personal 
uh, uh, neurotic reasons. Such pamphlets, furthermore, are only apt to confuse the adolescent who struggles with his inner emotions and urges without any help from the outside. It does not tell him what to do about it rationally. Such approach to juvenile problems is not honest but hypocritical and therefore is liable to distort the straightforwardness and honesty which is inherent in the living system and is developing during puberty." End of quote. Now this uh, child uh, uh, guidance man sent a copy of Reich's criticism together with his own to all the organizations in Ohio that would have been involved in Crombie's business deal. And as a result, these organizations decided to put off the decision to complete the business deal with Crombie, the $35,000 deal. This must have driven Crombie into a rage. He immediately fire, fired off a letter to the U.S. District Court in New York asking if Rock were an American citizen or not. And then, even before receiving a reply, he sent another letter to each of the organizations that had received a copy of Reich's criticism of his program. In this letter, he included the following description of Reich, which I think it is safe to say came from a couple of articles by a woman journalist named Mildred Eddie Brady, about whom I will have more to say later. These articles came out in 1947. One of them was like titled The New Cult of Sex and Anarchy, and the other was The Strange Case of Wilhelm Reich. They were cited and quoted from in many other publications during this time, and they were responsible for getting the FDA to start investigating Reich. So I have much more to say about this in her article, as I said later. My main point here is that Crombie's description of Reich was clearly taken directly or indirectly from Brady's articles. Crombie's description is as follows. He, Reich, is a psychoanalyst born in Austria where he was a member of the Socialist Party. He then went to Germany where he was a member of the Communist Party. Next he went to Denmark where he was deported for co corrupting the morals of youth. He fled to Oslo where he was also deported for corrupting the morals of youth. He followed Freud in his belief in loose morals, rents some kind of sex organ contraption, and is likely a sex maniac. That's the man who handles moral, who, who attacks morals and was quoted to you. Okay, now, this is, uh, he got this uh, information from the article by Mildred Eddie Brady, and uh, it, 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 those articles were quoted and reprinted in many magazines and many uh, other outlets in the United States. And the result of this uh, was that people got the idea that the organ accumulator, and I'm sure nobody here thinks that, the organ accumulator is directly related to uh, sexual functioning, that it enhances the experience of the orgasm, which is something very, very far from what Wright maintained. But this was the, this was the common, conception of the organ accumulator. Some of you may recall a movie by, uh, uh, called, uh, called, um, W.R. No, 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 no. Like this Woody is, Allen. Woody Allen? Huh? This is by Woody Allen. Oh, oh. Sleeper. Called Sleeper. Sleeper. And you remember what about Sleeper? He, he had the orgasmatron. The orgasmatron. <laughs> Taken directly from this, from this rumor about why. And a guy would get into the orgasmatron and come out with a great look of satisfaction on his face. This is crazy. Well, what, what happened was a, was a couple would go in, they'd come out happy, but yeah, in another case, Woody Allen went in by himself. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and came out as if, you know. <laughs> um, and so this rumor got him, oh, William Burroughs. You all know William Burroughs? Yes. Yeah. Just recently, he's quoted somewhere having said that, they, uh, that the accumulator doesn't work because he went into an accumulator and masturbated and it was no different than usual. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I want to sh show you a couple pictures of the public view of Reich at this time. And I'll take a short uh, 
rest of this is we do the best oh, great. This by Arthur Efren, who is a um, uh, literary scholar who has been using Reich's ideas as a way of looking at literature, uh, and uh, probably another presentation on uh, the nature of orgone treatment. So uh, keep uh, me um, with your name so I can keep you um, informed. And anyone who hasn't uh, paid me can pay me on the way out. I'll be at the door. <laughs> I'd like to uh, consider this picture for a moment. I was talking with somebody here about it. And of course, we can see the sleazy character, character caricature of Reich here. Uh, and of course, it has, uh, thank you, it has uh, uh, pornographic implications. But what, what do you think is going to happen here? I mean, why, why is this guy looking so sleazy? What, what's going to happen? It's too small a box. I'm sorry, louder. It's too small a box for two people to get into. <laughs> yes. She's going to take off her clothes. And he is. Yeah. No, she is. Oh, she is. He's when she goes into the accumulator? Yeah, but what good will that do him? Uh, what good will that do him? Uh, it's when she comes out. She'll be it's when she comes out. Right. <laughs> she comes out, he's waiting for her. I see. Okay. He's going to be charged. <laughs> Whatever it is, it looks like he's having more fun than he should be having. Uh, I uh, don't know if I said this, I spoke to the artist when my book came out in the 70s and wanted to publish it in my uh, book and uh, he refused to give me permission. He was a bit embarrassed about it. Uh, then in the German translation which came out about 10 years ago, they did publish that. And there hasn't been any uh, lawsuit or anything. They figured they're so far away, you probably wouldn't know about it. So, and uh, if there's a, uh, when my next uh, when the book is issued again, I'm hoping to be able to, to publish that picture there. I think it is a perfect personification of the kind of pornographic associations that people had with the accumulator as a result of Mildred Betty Brady's articles. It went on after that too. Because I'm sorry. It went on after that. If you look at uh, uh, the Wilhelm Reich, the function of the or uh, uh, the film, W R, yes. the function of the organ, yes. the pornography, and that's from the left. It's uh -huh. a leftist, you know, and, and essentially it's a pornographic presentation of what it's all about. That's true. That's true. Yeah. They have an accumulator there. Yeah, and everybody's having sex. That's you know? right. That's right. Okay, so let's see, where were we? Uh, I, had, I read you the uh, 
Crombie's description of Reich. Let me repeat. Reich is a psychoanalyst born in Austria, uh, where he was a member of the Socialist Party. He then went to Germany, where he was a member of the Communist Party. Next, he went to Denmark, where he was deported for corrupting the morals of youth. He followed Freud in his belief in loose morals, read some kind of organ uh, contraption, and is likely a sex fanatic. Uh, this is the man uh, who attacks morals and was quoted to you. Okay. Now, in spite of this letter, the board of directors of the Chambers of Commerce of the State of Ohio, to its credit, voted against adopting the youth pro uh, program, youth province program of Crombie's. But Crombie, true to the high-pitched energy of the emotional plague type, did not give up. Pursuing the matter of Reich's citizenship, he wrote to the INS office in Columbus, Ohio, uh, complaining that he had not yet received a reply to the letter he had sent to the New York office. He wrote in part, I don't know whether or not this film of Reich is being covered by somebody. Now, this is during the year. Covered? Covered. Right? Covered. Uh, the implication here, of course, is that there could be somebody in the INS interested in protecting Reich. And uh, this was an attempt by Crombie to capitalize on the historical fear of communist infiltration during the uh, McCarthy era. Then, adding to the uh, implication of a cover-up, Crombie threatened to go to the president and to the Senate committee investigating what was then called un-American activities if his question about Reich remained unanswered. A week later, he even had the nerve to send a letter directly to Reich asking whether or not, where and when he had become a citizen. A reply dated uh, 27th of August uh, over the signature of Dr. Alan Cott, some of you may have heard of him, yes. the hormone therapist of the time, uh, refused Crombie, Crombie the information he requested. In the meantime, Crombie's threat to the INS office in Columbus, Ohio, the one where he suggested there might be a cover-up of some kind, uh, had its desired result. A letter from the INS in Ohio was sent to the INS headquarters in Washington, D.C., recommending that an investigation of Reich be conducted. And again, I want to remind you the inadequacy of the word investigation. And a short while later, the New York office of the INS requested its office in Ohio where you will recall Crombie lived, to interview Crombie to, and I quote, ascertain what information he has in order that it may be determined whether consideration should be given to institution of cancellation proceedings. That's cancellation of, Amer of, of Rex American citizenship. There's something almost breathtaking at the ease and, and willingness of the INS to start considering that on the basis of such flimsy remarks that Crombie made. Uh, at that time, the fear of the communist infiltration was, as uh, some of you may have heard, and a few of you may even recall, uh, was like a national hysteria. And it was partly due to Crombie's plaguy exploitation of this hysteria that the bureaucratic machinery of another agency of the American government was put into motion against Reich. <clears throat> Crombie was interviewed by the INS in September 1948. The report on the interview gave the following as Crombie's reasons for believing Reich was a communist. Quote, Reich is attempting to destroy moral law insofar as they relate to sex. He was kicked out of Denmark and Sweden for corrupting morals of youth. He, Crombie, in the state, uh, stated that he felt that Reich had evidently concealed his background from the Immigration Service when he entered the country and also at the time of his naturalization. <laughs> now, Crombie had no basis for making this accusation or for making this suggestion. It was purely made up. Crombie, of course, uh, as I say, had no proof. Uh, but in an emotional plague type, proof is of no importance. <coughs> So once having set the bureaucratic machinery into motion against Reich, Crombie continued pushing for the sale of the program to the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. But the deal was dead. He could not bring it back to life. And with this, his role in the investigation of the INS 
comes to an end. <clears throat> but before I continue with this investigation, I would like to comment on Reich's general attitude towards the political confusion and hysteria of his time. Reich regretted that the main, uh, I'm sorry, Reich regarded the main uh, enemies as uh, originating primarily, if not exclusively, from the left. In fact, he often took seriously the possibility of extensive communist infiltration into the American government. And in fact, as I said, no, there was some uh, infiltration, though not nearly as extensive as he and many other people, including politicians, believed at the time. But being so focused on the dangers of communism, Reich seems to have overlooked or to have underestimated the fact that his views, especially as regards sexual matters, were so different from the accepted views that from a conventional perspective, there was little to differentiate him from the godless, sneaky communists that he had repudiated and that he had exposed so devastatingly. In other words, just as he seems to have misjudged Hoover, he also seems to have misunderstood or not given sufficient weight to the fact that to the rigid, conservative sensibility, especially that historical era, Almost any departure from conventional and accepted social norms, such as his departure in sexual matters, was sufficient to arouse the suspicion of communism. But to return to our narrative, as a result of the interview with Crombie, the INS wrote to the FBI and promptly received a summary of the interview between Reich and the Alien Enemy Hearing Board, which I mentioned earlier. The INS concluded on the basis of the information that, and I quote, it does not appear that Reich was amenable to deportation, end of quote. But then a new consideration arose relating to the law that stated that an alien could not become naturalized if he or she had been a member of a communist party within the preceding 10 years. Since Reich had been naturalized in 1946, this meant that he had to have been clear of communist affiliation since 1936. The possibility that he may still have been affiliated with communism during that, uh, any part of that 10-year period, the INS uh, report states, and I quote, was not sufficiently developed by interrogation or by investigation, end of quote. So now this possibility became the focus of the continued effort of the INS to have Reich But a strange coincidence occurred. Agents of the INS, while checking up on another immigrant, Ms. Erna Lang, found that she was a friend of Reich's living assistant in Forest Hills, a woman named Gertrude Gosland. Do you know, have you ever heard of her? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so the agents promptly began questioning people in the Forest Hill area, from which Reich had moved some eight years earlier, that is, in 1941. Ilse Oledorf tells us in her biography that one of the reasons they had left Forest Hills, the Forest Hills area, was that neighbors had been very nosy and suspicious and were constantly complaining about the Reichs. Well, it seems that they hadn't changed much in the intervening eight years. When the INS agents questioned the same people about Ernelang, these former neighbors gave much, quote, derogatory information, that is the phrase used by the INS, not only about Erna Lang, but about the Reichs. So the INS decided on the basis of this to continue its so-called investigation of Reich. That is, to continue trying to prove that Reich had been involved in communist connections since coming to the States so that he could be deported. One neighbor, to give you some examples of what they told the INS agents, claimed that Reich was a communist. Two others claimed he had, quote, displayed a large picture of Stalin in his living room <laughs> and also conducted what was considered a sex cult. And the report goes on, they all stated they could see pictures of Stalin from the street. 
Another neighbor claimed that Wright had sponsored large gatherings with placards extolling the principles of communism and pictures of Stalin, again, prominently displayed on the premises. None of these statements, of course, as I'm sure most of you realize, had any a particle of truth in them. Later, Erna Lang, the one the INS had been primarily interested in during its investigation, was questioned about these allegations against Reich, and she promptly reported them to Reich. In response, Reich, on December 15, 1949, wrote to the INS as follows. <clears throat> I would like to put on record that there were never any communists in my home, that there were never red banners at any time or any place in my home, and no picture of Stalin was ever to be found in my home. The only reality which is behind that story is that on the occasion of her graduation, my daughter Eva had given a party for some of her friends at my home in March 1941. This had no connection whatsoever with any political movement. I would appreciate it highly if you would help to eliminate the story by incorporating this letter in my file. So, the central office in Washington sent this letter to the New York office of the INS with a statement that, and I quote, a notation from Federal Bureau of Investigation indicates that the subject taught political economy at Communist Worker School. Right? We thought that that issue had been laid low. They found out who that uh, William Wright was not uh, Wilhelm Wright, but here it comes up again. One can only ga gasp and marvel at the stupidity of the bureaucratic bureaucratic mind that would permit an issue that had been presumably been laid to rest to uh, uh, come, rise up again. John Dewey, America's most illustrious philosopher of the 20th century, described the bureaucratic mind as a condition of occupational psychosis. <laughs> An American sociologist referred to it as trained in capacity. <laughs> I think both these characterizations would apply to many aspects of the confusion and sheer idiocy that often characterize the federal agencies in their so-called investigations of Reich. In any case, in response to this letter that I just mentioned, Reich was invited on January 18, 1950, to the office of the INS in New York. However, Elsa appeared in his place. The transcript of the interview that ensued shows Ilsa doing her utmost to convince the interviewer that the graduation party for Eva was nothing more than a mere party. <laughs> she must have been partly, partially successful because shortly thereafter, the INS decided that, and I quote, Dr. Reich is at the present time very anti-communist and he may be a valuable informant. <laughs> Consequently, arrangements were begun to have him interviewed for information about two suspected communists, a Leon Fruchtwanger, I don't know him, do you know, have you ever heard of that name? And a Hannah Peters. Okay. But then two new issues developed. One of them had to do with the fact that a well-known author, Arthur Kessler, some of you have no doubt heard of him, who had once been a devoted communist, referred briefly to Reich in an essay he wrote for a book titled The God That Failed. Now, this was a book written by, uh, in which there appeared articles by many former prominent Stalinists. Ignacio Salon, uh, Richard Wright, and uh, some of you can probably think of others. So, Arthur Kessler also, who wrote Darkness at Noon, some of you may have heard of that, it was made into a Broadway play, and it was very, uh, together with the uh, Orwell's uh, Animal Farm, the two books, uh, the two pieces by themselves were very instrumental in turning uh, educated opinion against the Stalinists. And you can probably infer from my, term, from my use of the term Stalinists that I used to be a Trotskyite. Uh, well, the INS somehow discovered this brief two-sentence reference to Reich. Together with this discovery, an allegation reached their office about a Dr. Edith Boxbaum. Is that a name familiar to you? She was in, uh, in the circle around 
She was in their circle. I see. In the States. Yeah. No, uh, I think in Europe. In, on, and in Europe. I see. Uh, she was another recent immigrant. Uh, and she was a very good friend of Reich's first wife, Annie. She had worked for a while in Reich's sex counseling centers in Germany. This allegation claimed that Reich <coughs> and Bauxbaum held secret meetings and engaged in subversive activities. These two developments, together with one about his being connected to the communist worker school, influenced the INS to continue its investigation of Reich, even as, in some weird, incomprehensible way, the INS was at the same time arranging to have Reich interviewed as an anti-communist to gain information about the two communist agents, suspects, I should say. Uh, Buxbaum was unknown. She was sent by Annie to find out whether Reich was going crazy. Uh, isn't that when, interesting? When Buxbaum arrived, and it was Buxbaum who was one, and you have to understand that Annie Reich and her circle were among those who were spreading very active rumors at that time. Yes. Um, yes. And that's documented in, 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 secret, in letters circulated among the old psychoanalysts who had come to, New York, to, to the United States. Uh -huh. They were circulating letters saying that it's clear that Reich has gone mad and is paranoid and is, and is dangerous. Yeah. I, I knew that Annie Reich did, uh, didn't know she was that financial it was actually Otto Fenichel, who had been Reich's closest friend, who was in, the, they had a secret letter uh, that went, that was circulated throughout uh, the whole old group of analysts that Reich had been the, the center of around the States yes. and in England. Yes. And um, in those letters that were handwritten uh -huh. um, and circulated. How did you uh, find that out, by the way? That's in Jacoby's book. That's uh, the run brief? What? The run brief? Yeah, right. What's yeah, the name yeah. of the book? Uh, the book, the Jacoby's book is called, uh, I think it's Out of Fantasy from the Circle, or uh, um, I have to get the title, I forget the exact title, unless someone knows the title, but um, uh, uh, Jacoby, um, more, um, I'll, I'll get you the title of the book, I don't have it. Fine, thank you. Uh, before the interview between the agents of the INS, and Reich, the INS again returned to Reich's old neighborhood in Forest Hills as a follow-up. Uh, the, new, the new interviews with Reich's former neighbors turned up more of the same kind of stuff as before. Now, in addition, the neighbors claimed that Reich performed abortions, that screams were often heard in the, from the basement of his house, that's that's probably true. <laughs> that there was not only a picture of Stalin displayed in his living room, but now also a brown bear of Russia, <laughs> decorated with ribbons. <laughs> One neighbor actually claimed that there was a picture on the Reich's living room wall of a man and woman behind prison bars with the title, For Free Love. Besides this, the neighbors complained that Reich always kept the shades of his first floor window down. <laughs> <laughs> then how did they see the pictures? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, among all these complaints, there was one about that fateful graduation party of Eva's. Now, it seems that at the end of the party, one person slipped on the ice outside, and a police as police and an ambulance were called. When they entered the house, the police discovered two horrible things. First, and I quote, that there was a mixed group, white and colored. And second, and besides this, there were mattresses on the floor. <laughs> this, of course, could only mean one thing, that white and blacks were engaged or had already engaged in free, a free love orgy right on the floor, right in front of each other and so forth. As a result of this, the police set up a listening post in a neighbor's garage in order to hear telephone conversations going on in the right household. But this led nowhere because almost all the telephone conversations were in charge. <laughs> <laughs> In response to my inquiry about some of the neighbors' reports, 
Ilse wrote to me as follows. There never was a picture of Stalin in our house. The one picture photograph that was prominently exhibited in the living room was an autographed photo of Freud. As to the other picture that they interpreted as being called Free Love, it now hangs in the museum in Organon. It was painted by Lizzie Lange of Oslo and entitled Nowhere to Go. And he picks two adolescents in the back alley. It also appears in that book, uh, People in Trouble. There's a copy of that. No prison bars, she continues. There were streamers in the living room, but no brown bear of Russia. I think it's appropriate to ask ourselves at this point if the neighbors who gave this slanderous misinformation several times about Reich were mass manifesting emotional plague symptoms. The answer, I would venture, is a qualified yes. Their malevolent lies were certainly plaguy, designed to harm, motivated by hate, and using sexual aspersions. They were probably little people in Reich's sense of the term leading relatively empty lives, so that the possibility of political subversion and sexual corruption in their own street must have been just too attractive for them to let such irrelevant considerations as honesty prevent them from believing. It was too much fun. It was fun. Fun. Thank you. Uh, and besides this, the fear and hysteria during this period about possible communist influence and infiltration probably contributed to these people's readiness to purvey such lies. That is, the more suspicion you could cast on someone else, the more pure and true and loyal American you would seem to be. And yet, I'm not sure that they could be considered emotional plague types of the kind like I described, of the kind that Crombie and Hoover exemplified. They were probably closer to the rest of us who, on occasion, may act or react in a plaguey way, but are not died in the wool plague, plaguey types. Of this kind of person, Reich had written, susceptibility to the emotional plague is universal. Just as every man somewhere in the depths is susceptible to cancer, schizophrenia, or alcoholism, so even the healthiest and most life-affirming among us is susceptible to irrational plague reactions. In any case, the INS did not take these allegations very seriously, for it continued to make arrangements for Reich to meet with one of their agents. And finally, on November 24, 1953, an inspector Finn from the INS came to visit Reich in a bargain hall. Since he came without a previous appointment, Reich was at first suspicious. But Finn managed to allay these suspicions as he recounts in his report of the meeting by saying that Reich's, and I quote, spirit of cooperation in disclosing communist aliens in the United States would be appreciated. And then Finn states later, the fact that Reich was about to be asked to identify a specific alien was not made known to him, end of quote. At this point, Reich was apparently deeply gratified by Finn's visit. He seems to have imagined that a long-held desire of his was at last being fulfilled. That is, that he was actually being given an opportunity to put his special insight into the perils of communism at the disposal of the American government, for which he had great respect. There ensued a general discussion between him and Finn, and finally Finn produced photographs of the two people suspected of being communists and asked Reich if he knew anything about their political activities. At that point, it must have dawned on Reich that this had all along been the main purpose of Finn's visit, that he, Reich, was just being used as a stool pigeon. And he flew into an absolute rage. Here is Finn's description of what happened to him, of what happened then. <laughs> Reich paced the floor and pounded the table. His face reddened. When asked if he had been offended, he said he had been. He had been insulted in being asked to merely identify suspected individual communist. That he wanted it clearly understood that his personal knowledge of communism extended beyond the political field and went deep into the heart of the philosophy of the present-day communist dictatorship as compared with Marxism. 
From that point, he pounded on the theme that the danger to the United States and the free world did not stem from the actions of mere individual communists, but because the United States failed to understand and get at the root of the communist disease. All of which, on the basis of what we know about Reich, his views and his temperament can, I believe, be taken as a more or less accurate description of what actually happened. A short while after the supportive interview, Reich wrote a letter to the INS with copies to Eisenhower and Hoover, offering to put his special insight into the communist disease, as he called it, at the disposal of the government's effort to combat it. Needless to say, nothing came of this. Hoover's copy of the letter has no action necessary written on it. In the spring of 1954, the INS did a neighborhood investigation of Reich in the range Dominion area. This produced no results, except that when people were shown pictures of Wilhelm Reich, of William Reich, they said it was not the Reich they knew. So at last, thank God, that matter was finally laid to rest. At about the same time, Ilsa was interviewed about, radical, uh, about Reich's radical activities in Europe. She stated very emphatically that Reich had left radical politics in the early 30s. An attempt was made to have Arthur Kessler interviewed, oh, I spoke a moment ago, uh, about his uh, 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 anti-communist article in which he mentioned that Reich had been part of a cell. But this effort led nowhere also. They couldn't locate him. Then a glimmer of hope came to the INS when it learned that Reich was going to be tried by the FDA. But as we know, the matter of Reich's radical past was never an issue in this investigation. Uh, so finally, in October 1956, an INS investigator drew up a lengthy summary of the whole case, which ended as follows. It appears that all leads have been exhausted and no evidence admissible in judicial proceedings have been developed which can place subject Reich in the Communist Party after 1933. There is no reason to believe that such evidence will become available in the future. And so ends the second chapter in the chronicle of Reich's entanglement agencies of the American government. I turn now to the third, the last and the most damaging, that of the FDA. The story of this investigation is covered in detail in my book about Reich's prosecution and persecution. So what I'll do here is briefly summarize the process and then consider some of its more important emotional play aspects. As with the previous two investigations, this one also was set into motion by a single person the journalist that I mentioned earlier in connection with Cromley's description of Reich. Her name was Mildred Eddie Brady. I'm sure most of you, many of you, not most of you have heard of her. She was an enterprising, energetic woman with a leftist background who managed to finagle an interview with Reich in 1947 and then wrote two derogatory articles against Reich. Of this interview, Reich wrote as follows after the articles came out. And you will see from when I read it that he at that time had not yet completely mastered English. He wrote, she sneaked into my office with false pretense, driven by her evil intentions. She represented that I promised orgastic potency through the use of the accumulator. Now I knew well why she said this when I recalled her sitting there in front of me in the easy chair with eyes glowing from genital frustration with eyes as I had seen them many times in many people of both sexes, of all ages and professions. I do not tell, uh, I do not tell public anything about the burning eyes in a woman body who expected orgastic potency from me, the king of orgastic potency, in the minds of so many frustrated cranks, clearly uh, frustrated cranks and biopaths who expected, I say, orgastic potency from me expressing this yearning clearly in her eyes as she looks at me and then smearing me up and down in public with that pornographic insinuation about the accumulator, which is supposed to provide orgastic potency. 
Then she turned her normal, natural desire into mud, which she then throws in my decent face. One of her articles appeared in Harper's Magazine, and the other, a month later, appeared in the leftist the New Republic. Do you remember the names of the article? The Strange Case of Oklahoma. The Strange Case, that was the one that went to Har Harper's. And what was the name of the other one? That was the New Republic. I'm sorry? The, the, the Strange Case of Oklahoma was in the New Republic. In the New Republic, okay, that's the one that got the FDA. Yeah, yeah. And what was the name of the other one? The New Cult of Sex and Energy. Yeah, new culture, yeah, that's right. The new culture, section. Who said that? In the uh, New Republic article, Brady criticized the government and the whole psychiatric profession for making no effort to stop Ryan, to stop his work, and especially to stop the growing influence of his work. This article came to the attention of the FDA, which then began its investigation. And again, you have to recall the inadequacy of the word investigation. Uh, uh, this investigation, as uh, did the later uh, FDA prosecution, derived its jurisdiction from the fact that organ accumulators were considered medical devices and that also they were being shipped across state lines. Both these circumstances made it a matter, a matter of federal rather than state law and placed it directly within the jurisdiction of the FDA, which was, as you know, uh, a federal agency. The first part of this investigation was conducted by the Eastern Branch of the FDA and ended in 1948, at which time a somewhat ambiguous report was sent to the Washington office. This report lay in the Washington office for some three years, while no action, no further action was taken. During this time, Reich, who had gotten some inkling of the FDA investigation, assumed that the matter was finished. But then in 1951, the FDA um, embarked on a wide-ranging anti-quack campaign. There were some 12 or so such quack cases, but money to pursue only a few of them. I learned when interviewing, I learned when interviewing by FD, uh, the FDA for my book that Reich somehow came to be included among these few cases because uh, of the fact that professional groups and individuals, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, doctors, responding to the Brady articles kept up an almost steady barrage of complaints to the FDA and urged it to take action against Reich's growing influence. This fact, it turned out, was probably of even greater importance in the FDA's decision. And after all, as a representative, an agent, so to speak, of conventional practices in psychiatry and medicine, the FDA could not easily ignore such pressure from the public. The Washington-sponsored investigation resulted in a legal complaint being served on right. I imagine most of you know the process. In it, he was called to appear in court to answer accusations which were based on information, or rather misinformation, that the FDA had gathered about Ryan and economy in the course of its investigation during the previous months. Such information included reports from highly respected medical and scientific institutions, such as the Johns Hopkins Hospital, MIT, and so forth. The manager. I'm sorry? The manager, the manager the clinic. Managers, Thank the you. managers were very, they, they were actively uh, involved in the campaign. They wrote letters and actually took out an ad, took out, uh, the AMA, I think, actually took out an ad that yes. Reich was convicted, uh, congratulating the managers in their, uh, their attempts to remove him. Uh -huh. So it was a very, very you know, you know, concerted effort. Yes. yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. They, they reprint the Menninger's Clinic's bulletin reprinted the Brady article. That's right. Yes. As proof. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the reports issued. Uh, so this gave the uh, the uh, made it necessary for the FDA to begin investigating. They really had no choice. Uh, but I showed in my book. Uh, the reports issued by these institutions, MIT and so forth, uh, 
were very defective in terms of the scientific te tests that were supposed to have been carried out. To give one example, at the John Hopkins Hospital, an organ accumulator was used on 22 patients in advanced stages of cancer. And the report concluded that, and I quote, in no instance was there any evidence to suggest this form of treatment efficacious, end of quote. Now the record sheet of this test shows that each patient used an accumulator only an average of 2.6 times. Whereas in cancer myopathy, Reich records that the fewest number of treatments cancer patients underwent with the accumulator was 40, while the largest was 170. And not, not, now that should be added that Reich was always clear that you could not simply treat cancer by using the accumulator. Yes. The accumulator was only part of the treatment and that you had to have a specialist there to deal with what happened yes. after, dur dur during, as a result of the uh, process of, of treatment. Right, right. As a matter of fact, he never claimed to have been able to right. cancer. Okay, now Reich, as many of you know, refused to appear. Something here. Oh, okay, refused to appear in the court to answer the complaint, saying, among other things, that a court of law even to mention the word orgo in any of his publications. And since most of his books were issued by the Orgone Institute Press, they all became illegal, even though some of them were, had been written uh, uh, earlier than before his discovery. In addition, the injunction ordered that all organ accumulators had to be destroyed, as well as many of the publications of the Organ Institute Press. And this was actually done in the later stages of the case. Reich's books were actually burned in the United States. Uh, witnessing one such burning, Reich commented, according to Peter Reich, his, son, his son's account, that his books had been burned in Nazi Germany, but that he had never expected to see this repeated in the United States. Just to add to that, I mean, Dr. Sobey, who uh, most of us know, was one of the people who had to, under federal uh, injunction, take the books out of New, in New York City out to uh, Gansevoort Pier. And he described the agents, uh, Reich had told them to cooperate. He and I think Maddie Levine loaded the books. I have some of the books that they threw in the back of a closet. I see. Not to say, I see. But, uh, they took them out there, and one of the, Dr. Sobey very poignantly said one of the agents actually broke down, who had been a, um, uh, a soldier who had liberated one of the uh, camps in, 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 in Nazi, yes. at the end of the war, actually broke down crying while they were burning yes, the books and said so. he couldn't believe that they were doing this. And uh, Reich's response was that he was a decent man, but, but you know, and not to be angry at the guys who, who carried out the activity. Yes. The first response to this injunction was made by 15 medical ergonomists trained by Reich who were trying to intervene in the case on the ground that uh, the injunction prevented them from pursuing their medical and psychiatric practices. But the judge would not uh, allow them to intervene. In the meantime, Reich refused to abide by the terms of the injunction, that is, organ accumulators and publications of the Organ Institute Press were not only not destroyed, but they continued to be shipped across state lines. And so, in 1955, a suit against him was initiated by the FDA. The original action of the FDA was a civil matter, but now it became a much more serious matter. Wright was now charged with criminal contempt. A trial took place in May 1956. I imagine most of you know that that I'm, not, I'm just going to go through it very briefly. At this trial, Reich to bring, tried to bring in what he considered to be the essence of the case against him, that is, irrational opposition to the hatred of his work because of a communist conspiracy on the one hand, and because his work constituted a threat to so many accepted assumptions of our civilization on the other. But the judge correctly ruled these considerations out, saying that Reich had had a chance to contest these points when the complaint was first issued. But he had failed to show up and argue his side of the matter then. And now the criminal contempt trial, the judge said, 
was only a matter of the simple question of whether or not Reich had violated the terms of the injunction, having nothing whatever to do with the merits or lack of merits in the, uh, of the organ accumulator. With such a restriction, and with Reich admitting openly and even defiantly that he had indeed disobeyed the injunction, the jury returned a verdict of guilty after meeting some 15 minutes. Reich was sentenced to a two-year prison term and his co-defendant, Dr. Michael Silbert, to a year and a day. Appeals to higher courts were turned down and so finally, in March of 1957, some 10 years after the FDA campaign had begun, Reich and Silbert were taken to serve their prison sentences. When Brady, the woman who wrote those first two articles, uh, learned of this, she wrote to the FBI that, and I quote, there's a kind of journalistic excitement in knowing that articles I wrote almost 10 years ago could bear such fruit. Strange fruits. Strange fruit. <laughs> That's the name of a, a song and the name of a book, wasn't it? Yeah. Billy Holiday. Billy Holiday's. I'm sorry? Billy Holiday's. That's right. That's right. And it should also be noted that uh, Brady died fairly young of cancer. That's right. That's right. Soon yes. after that. Yes. Oh, I should have that. Okay, so much for the bare bones of the case in the final chapter of the story of Reich's persecution and prosecution by three agencies of the American government. In terms of emotional plague involvement, I'd like to consider the four people who played the most important parts in the FDA prosecution. Brady, clearly corresponds to the emotional plague instigators involved in the other two investigations. Her articles were malevolent and intent, full of snide innu innuendos, distortions, half-truths, and outright lies, as she taught to arouse as much opposition as, uh, to Reich as possible. It was in one of these articles that I think I mentioned before that the rumor about organ accumulators bestowing upon its user the condition of algorithmic potency was first publicly perpetrated. Thereafter, when her article was summarized, reprinted, quoted from and all kinds of other publications from the very respectable journal of the Village of Clinic to cheap pornographic publications like Julian Stag and this one here, this racy bit of information was invariably included and even highlighted. And as a result, even to this day, one encounters people who know little about Reich's work are convinced that he actually did claim that the organ accumulator could somehow magically bring about the condition of orgastic potency, or at least that it was somehow directly connected to sex. Even as recently as some five years ago, oh, I, well, I talked before about the Woody Allen the movie. Uh, besides Brady, the three other people prominent in the FDA campaign against Reich was W.R. Wharton, chief of what was then called the Eastern Division of the FDA, Peter Mills, the U.S. Attorney for the State of Maine, and Joseph McGuire, the FDA lawyer who worked with Mills and who actually organized and presented the case against Reich. Wharton was a perfect embodiment of the emotional plague type. People who worked under him described him to me as ruthless and dictatorial. But more significantly, from the standpoint of what I'm exploring here today, is the fact that he was known among his subordinates to be pornographically obsessed with sex. He was said to keep a ceramic heart, ceramic penis, phallus, I should say, in his office, which he would not put out on his desk when any of his female secretaries came to take dictation. He certainly would not be able to get away with that in this day and age. When he eventually got an accumulator as evidence for his case, he kept it in his office and joked about it as a means of gaining sexual prowess. This is a box, he wrote on August 26, 1947, in a communique to Washington headquarters. This is a box in which a man is placed and thereby becomes permeated with orgone, which is a progenitor of orgasm. No kidding. Besides this, he was the one who began the rumor that Wright taught children to masturbate which became another one of the common lies that circulated about ergonomy. <clears throat> it is therefore little wonder that one of his co-workers said to me, Wharton was crazy about the right case and didn't think of anything else during the whole time. 
Of this aspect of the emotional plague type, Reich wrote that his sexual sexuality, and I quote, is characterized by the parallel existence of sexual lasciviousness and sadistic moralism. This dualism is part of his structure. How incredibly almost prophetic this description is as regards to what the man who led the FBI's campaign against Reich. Peter Mills, <coughs> the third most important person involved in the FDA case, was a main lawyer living in Reich's area who in the late 40s Reich had hired to handle legal aspects of the work of the Wilhelm Reich Foundation. But then in the early 50s, Mills quite coincidentally was appointed to be the U.S. Attorney for the State of Maine. That is, he became responsible for prosecuting any violations of the federal law that occurred in his state. And as a result, ironically, it fell to him to handle much of the case against Reich. It was largely he who, in 1953, led the effort of the FDA to gather so-called evidence against Reich in expectation of the trial, and so forth. He was rather embarrassed, he told me in an interview I had with him in 73, to learn that Reich, who had been one of his former clients, had apparently done illegal things. And I think it is fair to assume that much of the vindictive hatred and completely unscrupulous lying that marked his prosecution of the case against Reich and the so-called testimony he gave at the trial was motivated by this embarrassment and by his desire to demonstrate to federal officials that he would not let his past connection with Reich from pre prevent him from vigorously prosecuting the case. I just want to add something to Dr. So I asked Dr. Sobe about, you know, and he said that Reich actually was told by Hayden Reich's lawyer uh, that they could probably get you know a uh, you know a legal uh, you know uh, overturn based on the fact that that, that that Mills had represented Reich. Yes. Originally. Oh yes. Reich refused exactly. to do that, saying that he didn't want to destroy yes. his career. Yes. Yes. He, difference in character. He, he, he I'm sorry. He refused why? He did not want to destroy Mills's career. Is that the reason he that's gave? That's why he told Dr. Sobe. That's that's here. That's Sobe telling that to me. I, see, I assumed it was something else. I assumed that he didn't want to win his case on the basis of a technicality. He no, wanted to so win it on the basis of a principle. Dr. Sobe said that the one thing that Wright used to yell at all of the other ergonomists and people was that they weren't polite and friendly to the people. He would have to come in every morning and say hello to the judge, uh -huh. ask him how he was, and he was very friendly, very, very outgoing, yeah. uh, and refused to take it, uh, I mean, he would fight on issues, but on a personal level, he did not want to. Yes, I must uh, uh, add something else along that line. I was at the trial, right. and I remember uh, at the end of his address to the trial, Reich said something like, excuse me, this may not be appropriate, but I have to tell you it's been a pleasure just being here the past days and looking at your faces. <laughs> okay, I must say, uh, their faces did not appear particularly impressive to me. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I'm talking about uh, Peter Mills. Uh, he was the one who had drawn up the affidavit attesting to the functioning of the motor force in Oracle Energy. I was there, he told me in an interview, I saw that motor going like 60 when the orbone was turned off, end of quote. And yet, in spite of his exposure to the full range of Reich's work, he never seems to have been upset by it. Relations between him and Reich were consistently cordial. Several times he and his wife visited uh, the Reichs and had coffee with him. Had he been an essential emotional plague type he would surely have been disturbed by the sexual ramification of Reich's work, if by nothing else. For, as Reich noted, and I quote, the plague infected, the plague affected person find, fights against other modes of life even when they don't concern him in any way whatever. He is impelled to fight because he senses the very existence of other ways of life as a provocation. End of quote. And even more pointedly, Reich noted that such a type has a deadly, a quote, a deadly hatred of everything healthy, end of quote, and, quote, 
persecutes everything that is at variance with his uh, way of life with bitter hatred, end of quote. But significantly, Mills did not feel threatened or provoked by life or by any part of his work, which was at such variance with conventional morality and beliefs. He did not become hateful and vindictive until his own personal interests were directly threatened by his past association with Reich. Once that situation arose, however, he did indeed act in a most plaguy way and did indeed resort to life-destructive social activity, to use Reich's phrase. But since such activity apparently was not his typical way of behaving, since he did not exhibit it in his personal association with Reich and with Reich's work, he would more accurately have to be considered as simply a character neurotic who, under special circumstances, is impelled to behave in a plaguy way. As I noted earlier, Reich recognized that, quote, susceptibility to the emotional plague is universal, end quote. The difference between a person who succumbs to such susceptibility because of special circumstances and a bona fide emotional plague type like Wharton, Crompy, can perhaps be compared to the difference between someone who carries the germ of a disease in his or her system but is not affected by it until special circumstances arise and on the other hand someone in whom the germ of the plague, plague the germs of the plague are active from the very beginning. So much for Mills. We come now to the last figure in the FDA case against Reich, Joseph McGuire, the special lawyer assigned to the case by the FDA. He pursued the case with great tenacity and thoroughness. It was he who prepared the complaint which included all the so-called evidence to be used in the anticipated trial. And it was also he who interviewed people he intended to use as witnesses for that trial. <coughs> McGuire was, amazingly enough, one of the very few people on the government's side of the case who had actually taken the trouble to read any of Reich's books. But, being a devout Catholic, he was deeply offended by much of what Reich had said to say about sex and sexual functioning in our society. This deep aversion was probably what enabled him to feel justified in resorting to dishonest legal practices against Reich. For instance, McGuire cited passages from the cancer biopathy out of context, which made it seem that Wright did actually claim to have cured cases of cancer. Those of you who have read the cancer biopathy know that in most of the cases Wright reported, he was able to alleviate pain. He was even on occasion able to dissolve tumors, but he never claimed to have found a cure to the disease, which he saw as consisting of much more than tumors. Reich made it very clear in this book that even in those cases where tumors had been dissolved, the patients eventually succumbed to other complications of the cancer disease process. But McGuire, in his case against Reich, deliberately and dishonestly omitted this part of Reich's report on patients. And finally, it was McGuire's aversion to what Reich stood for that impelled him at the sentencing that took place two weeks after the guilty verdict to urge the judge to impose a three-year prison term, prison term on Reich and a fine of $50,000. The judge in the case, Judge Sweeney, who had a certain amount of sympathy for Reich, ignored uh, McGuire's efforts and even inst and instead announced a sentence of two years and a fine of $10,000. Even though this was much less than McGuire urged, it was still of unprecedented severity in such a case. In spite of his sympathy for Reich, Judge Sweeney apparently had pressure put on him to let Reich, to not let Reich off lightly. Given McGuire's rigid fundamentalist Catholic morality, he must have found much in the world, both in his official capacity and outside of it, that was objectionable and threatening. And like all true believers, whether the communist, fascist, or religious variety, his rigidly held code <coughs> enabled him to behave in unscrupulous and dishonest and vicious ways in combating what he could only perceive as a violation of the very foundations of his belief system. So much for McGuire. The last of the four men 
people, of the four people involved in the FDA's case against Reich. Uh, excuse me. So much for McGuire, the last of the four people involved in the FDA's case against Reich. But besides him, there were other emotionally aspects of this campaign that, in concluding, I want to go into briefly. One is the previously mentioned letters complaining against Reich and ergonomy, written to the FDA by doctors, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, as well as their professional organizations. I think that in most such cases, we can assume that the people involved were not necessarily emotional plague types. Some of them were, of course, motivated by hatred and malice. But many others, especially those that knew little about ergonomy, except through the rumor, through rumor, uh, since you believed that Wright was a quack and that organ energy, organ therapy, was nothing more than a cynical attempt by Reich and organ therapists to make money on the people's misery and sickness. Given such a belief, they can be thought of as having acted in good faith in trying to enlist the help of the FDA to halt such practices. In spite of their good faith, however, they did unwittingly contribute to the destructive work of the plague. The stream of letters of complaints sent to the FDI, FDA by such misinformed but perhaps well-meaning professional people continued, as I noted earlier, uh, constituted, as I noted earlier, an important and perhaps even determining factor in the FDA's decision in 1951 to renew the investigation of Reich and bring his case to a conclusion. And yet, as I say, we have to keep in mind that most of these letters were sent to the FDA from sincere, although misguided, concern for the safety of the public. Another aspect of the FDA's campaign against Reich, and that of the FBI and INS as well, for that matter, is the role that all the lower echelon functionaries in these uh, agencies played. A few of these were out and out hostile to what Reich stood for, such as, for instance, <coughs> The FDA inspector Keenan, who as I mentioned at the beginning, had Reich's failed opening the uh, post office in Wednesday May. But others were for the most part doing what they would have done in any other investigation, where they felt their actions would help eliminate threats of one kind or another to the public. I think they can best be classified among the bureaucratic types described by John Dewey earlier. That is, people having what he called occupational psychosis. This was certainly the case with FDA functionaries committed to the FDA's primary rational role of project protecting the public, who, uh, who were unable to differentiate between a real threat on the one hand and the great potential benefit held out by our economy. Perhaps, ultimately, they can also be regarded as carriers of the plague germ, but who were not actively affected by <clears throat> There's a doctor, Robert Pasotti. He wrote an article for the Journal of Ergonomy some years ago titled The Emotional Plague in Literature. In this article, he cites four elements required for the plague to do its work. They are, one, a genital character. Two, a plague character. Three, the total in, totally incomprehensible cooperation of circumstances. And four, the uncomprehendingly enforced cooperation of decent people. All of these were indeed present in the harassment of the so-called investigations Reich was subjected to by three agencies of the American government. I would like, however, to suggest that the, quote, cooperation of circumstances, point three, and the, quote, enforced cooperation of decent people, point four, that are cited by Dr. Pasotti, may not be as totally incomprehensible as he maintains. In what I have presented here, the cooperation of circumstances was quite clear. Panic following the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the FBI investigation. The McCarthy era and its rampant paranoia concerning communist infiltration into the government in the case of the INS. And the rigid conformity in public thinking and the consequent fear in the aftermath of the McCarthy era, which made it possible for, government, for the government to violate elementary civil rights in the FDA's campaign against riots. So these socio-political circumstances and their contribution to Reich's troubles are not altogether 
as to the, quote, uncomprehendingly enforced cooperation of decent people, that is part four, certainly mentions, we have seen that this too was really quite comprehensible. In fact, I would suggest that such contributory circumstances and such enforced cooperation are, in fact, inevitable in the world of homo normalis, as Rack called the average armored character of neurotic produced and masked by our society. In other words, armored society is the soil in which not only plague types are bred, but also the circumstances that often makes well-intentioned action become an ally of the plague. And perhaps that is the most important lesson to be learned from this examination of the way three federal agencies harassed, hounded, imprisoned, and finally succeeded in murdering Bill O'Reilly. that when Reich held the lecture, everyone was on time, and, and things started on time. But uh, I guess we've uh, deteriorated uh, at this point. Uh, one more. Hey, but I, I, you know, I'm assuming we can stay a little longer. People, anyone can leave if they have to, but if anyone wants to ask some questions, uh, I would assume that's OK. OK with me? Yes, sir. I have a couple of questions. Is the William Reich, was he, was he a doctor? Of course, because there's a woman, William Rice who was head of the Holocaust Memorial uh, in Washington until very recently. Not the same person. Not the same person. No. Right. He's also a doctor. And my uh, other question is, this goes on and on. About two years ago, uh, there was a lecture. Can you all hear it? Yeah. About two years ago, there was a lecture at Columbia University the Architecture School by a woman who I think was the chair of the Architecture School in, San, in Los Angeles, UCLA. And it was on Richard Leiter, uh former Beatty's architect in the U.S., and Wilhelm Reich. It was called Breaking the Box, or Opening Up the Box. And it was the most plaguing thing of ever. It got me so enraged that I couldn't even cope with it afterwards, except the tell her she was full of whatever. And I walked away and I didn't know how to handle it. And what she did was uh, project her own anxiety so clearly and uh, she had slides of all the diagrams from the back of the function of the orgasm and made a joke of everything. And uh, uh, tied this in with uh, sexuality and uh, box. And then she went to destroy uh, Reuter, who was a very fine architect also. Uh, they not, had no connection with the Bryce. I don't think he ever knew him. Uh, he never even heard of him. Uh, by some guilt by association with the form of the buildings. The whole thing was crazy. And it just came out of nowhere and disappeared. She was going to have a book published, which has never come out. And uh, what impels people to do this is what I'm trying to bring out. Uh, it's a disturbance. It's a perfect example of, of a plague uh, person going after someone who doesn't even exist anymore because the idea is a threat to her. That was the second thing. And uh, uh, yes, the uh, FDA has a museum in Milwaukee of apparatus, and one of them is the organ of human, they show very proudly. This is uh, one of the things we've described. Oh, that was really all the last time. Any other points or questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about the uh, the trial. You say you were at the trial. Just how that was covered at the time, whether it was mostly local media, or how that was um, basic media coverage of that. Well, let's see. I don't remember reading anything about it. I assume it was written up in the local paper, but uh, it was not of sufficient national importance to be covered by the usual media. Nothing was said about it. <coughs> yes, sir. S somebody in Maine has created a website, and I believe the, the local reports and the local main papers are on that website. I'm sorry. Somebody in Maine has created a website, and I believe yes. the local oh, yes. reports are on that the website from the Maine papers. Yes, uh, I think uh, you can get on the website through P O R E, poor. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, yeah. okay. 